Lord, I do thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the, the assembly that we have here for gathering together with one another. And I just ask, Lord, that your word would go forth, that we would enter into it, that we would think about it, Lord, and that you would do the work that you want to do in each one of us today and as we leave this place. And we give you all the praise and glory for that. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All righty. It's Labor Day weekend. We have the opportunity to celebrate a year's worth of work and economic achievement over this weekend by taking a rest on Monday. And it's an important holiday because when you think about it, we spend a large portion of our lives working. In fact, statistically speaking, research out of Gettysburg College says that we will work up to 90,000 hours in our lifetime. That's about a third of your life. If you're Warren Buffett, I think he's surpassed that because he is in his well, well into his 90s and he's still going strong. Most of us, 90,000 hours in our life. But as we celebrate the individual and the collective work of a year, we would honestly be remiss if we did not reflect on the most amazing account of work and rest in all of history. And it's found on the first page of your Bible in Genesis 1. But if we're honest, many of us, we just aren't sure what to do with Genesis 1. What are we to make of this account? If you grew up going to church, then you were likely taught to read Genesis 1 according to that denominational view that you went to, to that tradition. Most views maintain that the world was formless, it was empty, and Genesis 1 is telling us how God created all that is material. It's a story of how the non-existent came to exist. And there's a variety of views. Some views hold that this process took place within a six-day period. Others claim that the days aren't 24-hour days, but there's years, and there's gaps between those years. Some say that the earth is old, mankind is young. And those are just a couple of the views that different people hold. And depending on which perspective you're most familiar with, you can get entangled in some pretty serious debate. Has that ever happened to you? Are y'all out there? Okay, just making sure. You can get entangled in some really serious debate. I know I have. Whew, it's exhausting. And if you don't really enjoy debate, you just might be tempted to kind of skip over Genesis 1, head over to something that's not quite such strange territory. But avoidance is not a great option. And I have two reasons why. Genesis 1, it sets up the biblical narrative. It is the opening story of our Bibles. And number two, it's inspired scripture. Paul writes to Timothy this, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. So avoidance is not really the best response. Well, today, I'm not going to interact with any of those viewpoints about Genesis 1. Today, I would actually like to introduce a different approach to the text, an approach that invites all of us to set down all of our pers perspe perspective and assumptions about Genesis 1, to set it down and put on a completely different lens, like my glasses here that allow me to see. See, the typical approach that we have to most scripture, if we're honest, but to Genesis 1, would be this. We would ask this question, 
what does the text mean to me? What does it mean to me? And that is not a bad question, but I would say it's not the best start. So the question that we'll start with, and I encourage you to start training yourself with all scripture with this question, is this. What did the text mean in the ancient world? What did it mean in the time and in the place it was written? And when we understand that, or at a minimum are sensitive to that native context, we'll then be able to discern more clearly what the text means for us today. Because there's timeless principles that were for then and they're for now. So before we dive in, I'd love for you to just pull out your bulletin for a second, because on the very back of it, you'll see suggested resources. These are the resources that I have used to make the sermon, to put it together, and I'd love to share them with you. You'll notice that the NIV, the commentary is in there. Dr. John Walton is one of my favorite teachers. He is a professor at Wheaton University, he is an Old Testament scholar and interacts with over five ancient languages. So he is an amazing resource. You'll also notice that on the bulletin, you've got fill in the blank, and you also have some space where you can take some notes if you like taking notes. All right, so let's circle back to our quest to understand what the text meant in the ancient world. And I want to begin with this quote from Dr. Walton from the NIV Bible Commentary Series says this, to be accountable to the inspired message of the Bible, we're talking 2 Timothy here, we must find out what the text meant to them, the ancient author, the audience, because that meaning, it forms the foundation for what it means for us today. And so since we're already thinking about work and rest over Labor Day weekend, I thought this was a perfect sermon topic for us to dive into. So today's sermon topic is this, to examine how the ancient world understood the creation narrative in order to discover what it reveals about the work and the rest of God so that we can better grasp its significance in our modern day. So for today, we're gonna to engage three questions. These three questions are actually also in your digging deeper. If you don't want to rewrite them, I have them in there. The three questions will help us recognize how did the ancient world, the time and the place where this was written, how did they think about some of these things? Number one, we're gonna ask, what kind of beginning is Genesis 1 describing? Number two, what is an act of creation in the ancient world? And lastly, how did the ancient world understand the rest of God? Genesis 1, let's begin. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Genesis 1, 3 through 5. Now, we don't have time to read the entire account today, but I want to point out to you that the author will utilize a pattern. I'm sure you've read the account before. If you have not, you'll notice a pattern that introduces each day of creation. Each day is introduced with, God said, let there be. A creative act takes place. And then each day is concluded with, it was good the first day, the second day, through the sixth day. And so after just reading those first five verses, if you're like me, we assume 
that this is the beginning of how the fundamental elements of our material world came to be. That's what this beginning is about. However, if we only rely on our assumptions, those things we're going to set down for this sermon, we may unintentionally miss the inspired author's message altogether. And that's why our first question is very important. What kind of beginning is this? Now, you might be thinking, I thought there was only one kind of beginning. Anybody having that thought? Well, I have an illustration that I adopted that I think will bring much clarity to beginnings. I want you to imagine that you're driving down I-75, you're going to see a play at the Fox Theater, and you were excited to see this play. But the weather, it's really bad, and there's a lot of traffic. And to make matters worse, I-75 is down to one lane, if you can believe that. And you know that there's no way that you're going to arrive on time for the beginning of the play. And as you expected, you do arrive about 30 minutes late. So you get seated, and only after a few minutes, you're trying to watch, and you realize, I've missed some important things in that first act. So you lean over to the person sitting next to you, and you ask, how did the play begin? And lucky for you, this person's willing to accommodate you. And he responds, well, the play was written in 1934. It was actually a Pulitzer Prize winner that year. And what most people don't know is that the script, it was birthed as a result of the playwriter's depression. And you interrupt, oh, no, 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 no. I, I just want to know, how did it begin? And this well-meaning individual goes on to tell you about cast selection and stage design until you whisper with exasperation, I just want to know how it began. Are you tracking with me? Good. There is more than one beginning that can be told. It's actually a question of priority from the perspective of the communicator. See, one beginning prioritizes what happened since the curtain opened and scene one began. But another beginning prioritizes the inception of the play itself, the building of the set, the selection of the actors. So pivoting back to Genesis 1, when we read in the beginning, we assume that the author has the same priority that we have. We assume his priority is the same as ours. And I think you'll agree that the modern reader, as modern readers, we prioritize a beginning that tells us how God made the cosmos. We are anticipating a cosmology of the universe. Cosmology. The science of the origin and development of the universe. A cosmology of the earth is certainly one kind of beginning. It addresses the material process behind the formation of the cosmos. But a cosmology was not a priority in the ancient world. The author is describing a different beginning. It's like the illustration I just shared. My beginning prioritized what happened in the first few scenes of this play. And the person I asked, he prioritized the inception of the play and all the variables contributing to its formation. Let's look at verse 1 and 2 again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, when we read this verse, the words heaven, earth, formless, empty, they jump out at us, and we will address them. But they are actually not the main event. And unfortunately, these descriptive words, they tend to overshadow the author's main point. 
his priority, which is this. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. See, we have to remember, within a landscape of polytheism, the worship of more than one God, there actually existed many creation accounts. Sumerian, Babylonian, Egyptian. And these accounts credited creation to other gods. So the author of Genesis 1, he's prioritizing identifying the who. He puts a stake in the ground in a culture confronted with many gods that it's Yahweh, Israel's God, who did all this. It is his spirit that hovered over the deep. No other God. What kind of beginning is this in the ancient world? Genesis 1 tells a beginning that prioritizes who is the agent of creation, not how the material world was formed. And so the author, he's going to set up the rest of the six days only after establishing it's God. It's Yahweh. It's not Tiamat, the goddess of the Babylonians. It's Yahweh. It's not Inki or Enil of the Sumerians. It's Yahweh. And that brings us to question number two. What was an act of creation in the ancient world. What did it mean to create? It seems obvious. In our day and age, creation deals with processes that produce something material. Creation involves a transition from non-existence to existence. Well, the transition from non-existence to existence, it, it's a thing for the ancients too. They had categories for non-existent and existent. But those categories are actually very different than ours. Now, I want to put the verse back up, verse 1, so you have it just fresh in your mind. And remember those words we talked about, formless and empty. Now, I suggested that they are not the main event, but they are still very key because they are important to understanding how the ancient world understood what it meant to exist or not to exist. See, in English, formless and empty, that gives me the impression of nothingness. But the Hebrew it has a very different nuance. In Hebrew, formless and empty is tohu vabohu. Do you all want to say that? It's fun. Oh, come on. Tohu vabohu. I have adapted that into my vocabulary. You'll see why in a minute. <clears throat> tohu vabohu. And it's 20 occurrences in the Bible. It almost always describes wilderness and wasteland. Wilderness and wasteland are not necessarily describing something immaterial, which is non-existent in our terms. Tohu vabohu, wilderness and wasteland, describes something that was disordered chaotic, without function. Tohu vabohu described things that have no purpose or obvious benefit. So I have an example of what this means. In Egyptian creation narratives, the sea and the desert were categorically non-existent not because they don't have materiality. There's certainly water in the sea. There was sand in the desert. They were considered non-existent because they were chaotic. They were purposeless. 
they were not considered of a part of the ordered life. And I can attest to that being from El Paso, that the desert is pretty pointless. So if you notice, we have a fill in the blank here for this key thought, if you want to use it on your bulletin. But the key thought is this. In ancient thought, something was considered non-existent if it did not have a beneficial function or was considered chaotic. Didn't exist. It's not our category. It's theirs. Now, Dr. John Walton, commentator for NIV, says this. Formless, tohu, describes a situation in which positive qualities like purpose and value are lacking. As a result, it's more appropriate to translate tohu in English as without function. And I thought it would be helpful to see tohu in another verse. So here's one from Deuteronomy. This is just one I picked out. Deuteronomy 32.10 says this. He found him in a desert land and in the waste, howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Deuteronomy 32.10. The desert in the ancient world was devoid of positive qualities. It did not benefit life. And therefore, it was part of the unordered realm. And this is really key to understanding what the acts of creation displayed over those six days accomplished. The author is not describing the materialization of light and land or starry host. Rather, he tells how God ordered the cosmos to bring benefit. So here's a key thought. God's acts of creation made that which was non-existent exist because now it was ordered and could foster purpose and benefit for all life. When we began with the question, what does the text mean to me? And don't first consider, what did it mean to them? We might miss the author's message altogether. And this is a very different approach to Genesis 1. And we're probably not used to handling scripture in this way. So it's okay to feel super stretched right now. But I do want to share an illustration that I think will help bring things together for you in your mind to help you consider what we discussed this far. So when my husband and I, we moved from Fort Worth, Texas to Troy, Michigan, we packed up our two-bedroom apartment along with our two dogs, Rocky and Nate. I have a picture of Rocky and Nate. Nate is the pug in the wheelbarrow. That is my first dog outside of college. And we wanted to get to our home in Troy before the movers arrived with all those boxes. We wanted to walk through our unordered home. It was very tohu va bohu to decide how to best utilize the rooms. So we had a purpose in mind. We were going to make this house a home. This is where we were going to dwell. This is where we hoped to start a family. And we wanted to order the rooms in a way that fostered purpose and would benefit our lives. And so we walked into this really large room. It had a fireplace and it had a sliding glass door. We looked around and we said, ooh, we should put the couch right here because that's a really good view out into the backyard. And we could put the TV over here. And my husband and I, we called the room the living room. And we agreed, yeah, that's good. (laughs) And then we walked into another room, and it had this little nook just under a window. 
And we said, hmm, let's put the dining table there. But then we thought about it. We're like, no, 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 no. We like to have more people over. Our table's pretty big. We need a little bit more space. So we walked into another room, and we called it the dining room because we saw it would be more functional for us. And we looked at each other, and we said, yeah, that's good. And as we walked through our unordered home, we spoke out how it would be ordered. And we saw that it was good. Because in fact, this was our home story. Now, interestingly, there is another story that I could have told you right now. And that story is called our house story. It's not our home story. It's our house story. And it's a beginning too. If I was going to tell you that story, it would start with the breaking of the, of the ground back in 1978 and the pouring of the foundation. We'd pull out the blueprints and we'd check out the load-bearing walls and with the supporting beams and the wiring and all the plumbing. Both a house story and a home story are important. Both are beginnings. And I submit that Genesis 1 is a home story. The author intended to tell how God ordered the world that I am quite convinced he created. But he's intending to tell us how God ordered that world to be a home. A home with purpose that would be beneficial for all life. Even as you sit with the narrative and you walk through those days, you can see that the count, it underscores order. You'll notice how the acts of creation are ordered into six days or six series. On days one through three, God ordered the realms or the rooms, the sky, the water, the land, on days four through six, God assigned inhabitants to those rooms. Flying creatures, swimmers, land dwellers. And he saw that it was good. This is going to work. God's work has order, function, and benefit. Question number three. What was the rest of God in the ancient world. Well, after reading how God organized the realms and the inhabitants, we come to day seven. We find this in Genesis 2, verses 1 through 3. It says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So here's a good question. What does God resting on the seventh day have to do with the creation narrative? How does it fit into this account? Remember. At the beginning of our time together, I suggested that we don't want to avoid Genesis 1. Not only is it inspired scripture, it's informing how we read the rest of the biblical narrative. There's some important concepts in Genesis 1 that are timeless principles. Now, we just read that God blessed the seventh day. He made it holy. Why was it holy? Why was it set apart? Well, it tells us it's set apart because he rested from the work of creating. But what does it mean by rested? There's more going on here that meets the eye. Because if we assume that the ancient world understood the rest of God like we think of resting on Labor Day, which is coming up, we will miss the author's message altogether. 
So here's a key thought, another fill in the blank. Finishing the work of creation does not result in God's disengagement. It signals his engagement. It is time to move in. In the ancient world, when the gods rested, it meant they took up residence in their temple. What did they rest on? It meant that he or she was seated on their throne. It's not a hammock. Seated on the throne. Scripture witnesses to the fact that God is seated in the heavens. If you read the Psalms, you know this. God is seated in the heavens. In the earth, it's his footstool. Genesis 1 is a home story. It's a temple. But here's what I really don't want us to miss. It's so, it's so key that God wanted to be known and dwell with creation from the beginning. It was always the desire of his heart. You have read this statement over and over in your Bible, and it's this one. I will be their God, and they will be my people. It appears in over 43 verses. It has been his desire from the beginning to be known by his free agents that he created. Free agent, meaning we have choice. And he would be revealing himself. I have some scripture for us just to review. There's three. I didn't pull all 43 of them up. It says this. Exodus 29, 45. Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. Ezekiel 14, 11. Then the people of Israel will no longer stray for me, nor will they defile themselves anymore with all their sins. They will be my people. I will be their God, declares the sovereign Lord. Jeremiah 32, 38. They shall be my people. I will be their God. Rest. It's not something God only does on the seventh day. It's what he does every day in his place of rule. Amen? John Walton says it way better than I can. He says this, If God does not rest in this sacred space, the six days of creation are without their guiding purpose. That's how it fits into the narrative. Now, I don't know about you, but understanding Genesis 1 as a home story, this increases my joy. This brings me so much hope that our God is engaged and very present with us. He has ordered this home so we can co-labor with it. We don't want to let it go back to tohu vabohu, which it, that's why we have all these covenants. It has. But he didn't only order this home for us. It's not always just about us. It's a place where he can dwell with us and be known and chosen by us. I'm pretty sure this sermon has given each one of us a lot to think about. It is certainly not a quick study. So I really encourage you to take some time. You have all day Monday to sit with Genesis 1, take a look at that account, and consider that the concept of work and rest is introduced on the very first page of our Bible. And I would submit that this is not a house story. We might not have to debate any of those issues. I'm not going to force anyone. Just get hungry. You can decide on your own. But I would submit this is a home story. And how we understand it, it will shape how we understand much of the biblical narrative. And I want to close with this final quote. This is from Tim Mackey. He is the creator of 
um, the Bible Project, if you've seen some of those videos. He has a PhD in Hebrew and biblical studies. He says this, After many years of pastoral ministry, I have found that some of the main misunderstandings people have about Jesus come from misunderstanding the larger biblical story that he brought to fulfillment. When we try to understand who Jesus was without reference to the Old Testament, it's kind of like watching the Star Wars movies, but skipping the first episode. You can follow what's going on, but you won't really understand the deeper elements of the story. Amen? Amen.